I've never seen anything like this. No firefighter feels good about what happened. This was our house. Your stove? Yeah. It seems like, as a country, we'd be able to do it quicker if it was a priority, right? They've spent billions of dollars here. This is eight months later. This is still where we're at. So this is downtown Lahaina. That's the result of people being displaced. It gets complicated pretty fast. We don't even know when or how we'll be able to rebuild. This was the initial temporary housing. Is there any of that going on now? People coming in with huge money and buying up parcels? A lot of people everywhere don't trust the government to do what's best for them. You'll see signs, keep Lahaina lands in Lahaina hands, but it's like, okay, in about six months, people are gonna run out of insurance money and go somewhere else. Good morning, guys, here in beautiful Maui. And today we're gonna go around this point here, the city of Lahaina. And most of you know of Lahaina because of the fires that ripped through the city last August. Well, many months have passed by and the cameras have left for the most part but the story continues. What is it currently like? So that's what we're gonna get into today. We have the great privilege to meet up with a local firefighter who said, Peter, I can show you what's going on in the city, potentially even get you into the burn zone and give you a greater perspective on the current situation in Lahaina. Let's do this. So this is the north side of Lahaina here? Yeah. The fire came up to what, this point right here before these homes? It actually went around it. Where we're standing burned, it came back down. And that neighborhood's our neighborhood. That's White Cooley neighborhood. That's, that burned as well. The fire started over there on the other side of this bypass. The fire moved downhill super fast, house to house, you know, pretty much from the mountain to the ocean okay. in an hour or two. Hour or two? Yeah. Our home, hung on for a while. My wife is a firefighter as well. She was working. Um, the initial push through is when I left with the kids, when initially burned through the neighborhood, our home survived that. And my wife was driving in and out, you know, when they were pulling people out. And uh, like the third time they were in and out, she saw our house on fire. Definitely, I don't you know, nobody feels like it's their fault, but no firefighter feels good about what happened. They, you know, they did their best, they risked their lives, you know, whole crew just about died. They, they had to, st you know, there's a whole story about them stealing a police car and barely making it out of there. You can't stop thinking about it. You, you, it's hard to go back to sleep. You start reliving things through your head, you know, and some of the people with FEMA, you know, the people that were searching the ashes, they've, they've done this a lot and they, they've kind of explained the process of like your body is still in that fight or flight mode, it's in an adrenaline mode, and you know, it's, it's a couple months before, you know, that, that kind of wears off and you, you kind of move to the next phase. And I think sadly, some people, you know, they haven't had steady housing, they haven't, you know, I, I think it lasted much longer where they're in this, you know, the, the adrenaline state, you know? Right. So we're gonna get into it a bit today, but from my understanding, there are many different stories. Some people's houses didn't get burned, like if you're over here, I guess. Yeah. Your situation, you're living in a rental now, right? Like your house was taken out, but you're living in a rental with your family? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of different scenarios that people are in. Everybody lost their town. You don't end up in Lahaina on accident. It takes a lot of work to be here. It's expensive, it's out of the way. You either have connections out here or you love the place and probably both, you know? The loss that everybody shares is, you know, we lost this town that we all put a lot of effort to be in. But then after that, it, it varies a lot, you know? I couldn't imagine having lost close family members. Don't, Should I put the camera down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't film these guys. Yeah, don't, don't show their faces. Though. I didn't, okay, I put the cool. camera down. Just let me know whatever you want. You yeah. Know, whenever like, I, I gotta mean, put it down. They're doing their job. Like, I'm supposed to be here, but I don't have my placard, so. Yeah. I just, Wow, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. It started in the grass, pushed into the houses. Once the houses got going, there's no stopping it. You know, there's chunks of wood that are all charred. 
So imagine a chunk of wood that big on fire flying at 60 miles an hour. If it lodges under your deck, it, you know, whatever, it hits a right. uh, wood shingle roof, it's everything spreading. The house survived right there, right on the line of the burn. Mm -hmm. Were they just watering their house or it's just the way the wind ripped through? It's just and... the way the wind, and I think part of it is the wind shadow. You know, maybe this neighborhood got spared, but okay. the wind wasn't consistently blowing the same direction all the time. It would push and then it would relax. It would push and then it would, you know, it's not like there was just this massive flame front that pushed through town, right. you know, from Malco to Mackay, where it's, it would push and it let off and push and let off. And so... You know, as the houses get thinner and thinner, there's less fuel to spread it. Mm -hmm. They're not, it's not gonna burn every single one. Yeah. This is just above our house, it's all burned. And then all our neighbors are actually, you know, their homes all made it. So I think that's what happened is it creeped through some of the grass in the backyard okay. of our neighbors. We had a rental right there. So this is our house where that washer and dryer is. That was like a little detached studio, and then our main house was right next to it. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, so this is terrible. This is our house. Our neighbor's cats. Yeah, we actually found our cats like uh, a week later. Uh huh. Or like a few days, and then a, a few weeks later, that we had two cats. But the neighbors, the neighbors have been living here ever since. You These know, guys over here? Yeah, okay. they're, they're tough. <laughs> Pretty gangster <laughs> to be in this for the last eight months. What is that stickiness I get under my shoes? I, you know, there's a few solvents and whatever that they've pulled out. So obviously none of this stuff's good for you, this ash. No. We don't want to be breathing it. We don't want to be kicking it up. This was our Ohana. That's what they call like a mother-in-law unit. That was a, a room or a, a studio that somebody lived in. And then this was our house. Okay. So we bought it four years ago now. Oh, man. It was just, you know, it was totally remodeled. So our home didn't have the lead paint. It didn't have asbestos and all that stuff. Okay. Like it was basically a modern home. We sifted through this, you know, that's why you, this is kind of a pile. It's kind of cleared out. This was our bedroom. We're looking for jewelry, whatever to take from it. I gave up pretty quick. There's, there's nothing in here that I want as a memory of our home. You know, there's nothing survived this. That's our... That's my gun safe. I mean, you can look oh in it. Oh my God, it burnt the safe. Yeah, it wasn't like a fireproof safe, but those are guns. Those like, that's... Yeah, that's the barrel of a gun right there. Yeah, so, I mean, what's, this is inside a metal, it burned through the metal. I mean, part of that's probably ammunition going off, which don't put ammunition in a gun safe. Where do you that's want to put it? In a separate safe. Don't put it with anything valuable. So, oh, yeah, 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 gotcha. um, Yeah, so a lot of people learn that lesson the hard way. This um, is your, your stove? Yeah. Yeah. Why are your ashes still here? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I think, honestly, it comes down to paperwork and semantics. The reality is, is they can't do everybody's at once. There's not enough crews here, okay. construction crews. There's some lots that are cleared, you know, and they're doing well. The construction crews in there are, are busting their ass. It's like, it's hot, it's sunny. They're wearing Tyvek suits. They're cleaning these down, you know, six right. inches of topsoil at least. And, you know, they're just out here working 12 hours a day. And then you have unique situations, you know, in Hawaii, we CPR a land, condi minimize a land to split it into different lots. It's, it's different than subdivision. It gets complicated pretty fast. We don't even know when or how we'll be able to rebuild. There's not a lot of developers. There's not a lot of contractors out here. The scope of this thing is so big. Yeah. Nobody has has the blueprints for it and nobody could just figure it all out at once but at the same time it, it, it's eight months later we have no control over when this gets done it's up to army corps of engineers fema the county and in the meantime we're expected to pay our mortgage on it well you you got to pay your mortgage on this right now yeah so you know, in we have, you have insurance right? yeah we have homeowners insurance yeah and homeowners insurance they give you a specific amount, you know, like this in a full loss. They're giving, I mean, let's talk real numbers. Nobody ever wants to talk real numbers. This okay. is, we paid $800,000 for this house. Okay. They're giving us $270,000 to rebuild. That's, that's what our plan was. And then there's, if you reach, if you max that out, it can go up to 35% over that. So 
But less you, than four hundred thousand dollars to rebuild our home in in one of the most expensive areas. Yeah, maybe we had a plan. Maybe we should have updated. You know, but who who honestly goes in every year? Oh, uh, inflation is up eight percent. I should adjust my homeowner's insurance. You know, like when you think of insurance, that's kind of what you think of. Oh, we're taken care of. You know, we'll, we'll pay somebody to build it. I'll keep working my job, probably two jobs. You know, that's kind of what you have to do out here. To make You're it. firefighting and doing what else? Uh, I work security sometimes. Uh, we had two businesses and those burned down. So that's kind of a different. You and your wife had two businesses? Yeah. So oh, we had man. a surf school and a coffee shop oh, in town. man, I'm sorry. And complete burn down, we're, we're underinsured. They pay us for 12 months an alternative living expense. So, you know, they pay our rent for 12 months. Okay. So what happens Who, when- The insurance company does or FEMA the, does? The insurance company okay. does. If you have homeowner's insurance, FEMA denies you benefits. They gave us our $700 check and then said, you guys are denied insurance or um, benefits if you have homeowner's insurance leases but what, what's and all with that the, I, I did hear of that. I think most people in the country heard of that $700 and it seemed laughable. Like, yeah. What, what I mean, is that it, for? I, just to help, you know, like to help pay, <laughs> buy groceries. I don't know. I don't know. Who thought that one out? I don't, I mean, right. Right. Like any, any amount of money helps. Yeah. But that in, in that situation at that time, it seemed really, uh, in poor taste to, to give out like, yeah. Like, $700 these days. Doesn't yeah. Go very far. Especially yeah, I mean, here. there's, there's literally people, you know, still searching for their family Yeah. and they're talking about a $700 check. You're holding very calm through all this. Fair to say. Uh, I, yes and no. I mean, yeah, you have your ups and downs, but okay. I, I haven't had a breakdown. It doesn't seem like it's going to help to to freak out and break down and and you know. Sure. But I mean, there's times where I'm super angry. We have no control over this process. The government has blocked off our land. You know, whether it's to search through the ashes, to do the EPA to come through. All these things we need to happen, right? And all these things we can't do on our own. But to, to, to be blocked from your own land that you, and then still have to pay your mortgage on it. I mean, not, it's insulting, but it's also not sustainable. Like who, once this goes over a year or two, right? who can afford to pay their mortgage and rent? I mean, like I said, So you're, is, you're saying now because your, mortgage, your rent's being covered, your mortgage is being deferred, there'll be, a, there'll be a time where it's not deferred? So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, if you have a loan that's owned by them, you get 18 months of deferral is what they've told us, you know, and, and so much of this is just what you hear. It's not like there's just a big portal that gives you all this solid 100% information. But at, at some point, if we, even if we could defer it for five years, you're eating up all your equity. Yeah, you know? yeah, and you're like not it, living in it. We're gonna have to take out SBA loan probably to finish construction on it. Mm -hmm. So that's eating up more equity and it's a bigger monthly payment. We're gonna have to build a $1.5 million house, $1.7 million house, mm -hmm. just to like have equity in it for the bank to be satisfied. You know, so it's, it, there's a lot of players involved in that property, you know, the banks, insurance company, FEMA, county. As an owner of it, with all the liability of it, we have the least say of anything right now, so. You can't speak for everyone, obviously, but people that are in your similar situation in this neighborhood, you think you guys all sort of feel the same way about this or I'm sure you're talking with your yeah. friends dealing with the situation. Well, it's, it's hard because the town itself doesn't have a lot of homeowners. It's 87% renters is what. Are you serious? That's what the numbers I got from FEMA when they, they, they did a presentation on housing. Okay. And they said 87% renters. And then another number we just got from, I don't know, somebody that would know better than us. Uh huh said they have, there's only like less than 600 owner-occupied properties. In all of Lahaina? Yeah, because the rents are so high. You know, the rents are... Like what would rent be for something like this in Lahaina? Uh, 1,100 square foot house, maybe five grand. Before the fire, now, who knows, you know? They're... So rents have gone up big time? So obviously the supplies, yeah gone you know yeah. and then fema is paying existing homeowners you know elsewhere they're paying them outrageous amounts to rent their home to survivors so if you have a home 
anywhere on island and you have a spare one, you can get up to like $12,000 a month from FEMA for a three bedroom or four bedroom house. Okay, so, so, so some people are doing pretty well from this whole thing. Yeah, and I mean, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing as, as like, I hate to label myself as a victim, but as somebody who, who lost a lot in this fire and, and yeah. trust me, there's plenty of people that lost a lot more. Okay. But um, it, we, it's hard to get ahead in any of this. And then you see other people getting ahead and I don't, right. I, I want them to, I want everybody else to get ahead, but yeah. I want to be able to get ahead too. I want to be able yeah. to pay my mortgage too. Okay. So, you know, I, it's, you have to resist the, it's like a natural human instinct to, you have to resist when you see other people doing well, coming up in this, it's easy to say, oh, you know, they're taking advantage, but most people are just doing what they can. It's hard enough to make it out here as it is, you know? Yeah. So most people are just doing what they can. You know, I, if you were in their situation, most people would probably do the same thing, you know? Explain these to us, please. So after the fires, they brought dogs through after every major FEMA disaster they have, they do a search for, for bodies. Mm -hmm. After that, and that took a few months, that is what it is. Like, you gotta search for the bodies. You gotta get a, you know, understand who, who died from it and everything. But after that, okay, we start the cleanup process. The first step is, this is hazardous. These are hazardous areas. EPA comes through and they pull out whatever hazards, you know, propane, compressed air, uh, batteries, things like that. You know, partially environmental, partially like safety hazards for crews. Um, so that's what this this is. Okay. This, they check on there, say it's done. So now it's ready for a debris removal program. Each one of those got to be signed off. And so we're stuck at this phase. We're waiting for debris removal. Okay, you've gone through all of this. Yeah. And you have that to go. Because this ash, it's toxic. You know, there's so much of it. Nobody wanted this stuff in their backyard. So they proposed a bunch of different places to put it. The, the, where it's going right now is at the Oluwalu dump site. They, they excavated a big temporary place, lined it with, you know, thick plastic. So this stuff doesn't leach into the ground. Nobody wants it anywhere. Nobody wanted Oluwalu. Oluwalu is a pretty, sacred place a lot of history there a lot of the the reef is is it's a key reef in the whole island system so nobody wanted it there but all that takes time you know yeah. we're, we're sitting months months and if they wouldn't approve the temporary site in Olawalu, they, they wouldn't have cleared a single lot we'd still be sitting here sitting on our thumbs so waiting what, for... what we drove into is just a small part of it all right yeah this okay. is just part of the neighborhood so with your businesses, did you get insurance money on those? We didn't have insurance on that. Wow. So yeah, that, that's, as of now, is just a total loss. So. Your wife and you, both firefighters full-time and ran two businesses? Yeah. And have two kids? Yeah. You're busy people. Yeah, so yeah, and that's, you know, to add to or to talk about our situation, we're pretty, you know, in all of this, we're doing pretty good. We had homeowners insurance. We have jobs. Okay. We have family around. We're not, we're, you know, we're not old. We have, we can help with the construction process. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are way worse than us. You know, there's a lot of people that they had their, their family owned the home outright. You know, they paid it off. That was their, their savings. That was their retirement. And they didn't have it insured. Oh man. So, and, and that's not, from what I've heard, that's not like super uncommon. So what happens to those people if they don't have insurance to put them in a rental, FEMA comes in? Yeah, so they, they're eligible for FEMA benefits for a while, you know, and, and you know, they'll be taken care of, but where are they gonna get $500,000 to build their home? I don't know. Right. And so that's like old local Hawaiian families uh, that that's, have been here forever. That, I, I've never seen any numbers and, and who okay. owns what and how, but from what I've heard from people that are here, that's that's what it, it is. It's you know people that have been multi generations. They've had houses paid off for a while. People can't come in here, right? We had to go back past the security there. They yeah. can't just drive through here. Yeah, you have to be a resident. Yeah. So there's a handful of people that are living in here. There's a handful of people that are working you know, on their homes or on their property. Now with the construction crews, are they bringing them from the mainland? Cause no, it's, it's almost all local people. 
And then you come out and it's like back to somewhat normal life. Yeah, so this is pretty much the, the part of Lahaina that's been spared. This is in the wind shadow of that big construction project and Lahaina Gateway. I mean, any, anywhere that has big parking lots, it's not gonna spread as much, you know, there's right. just, there's big open space. And so was this empty for a long time? And then it yeah, came back so to they, life? Or? they just opened this mall. It wasn't because it was burnt, it's just because it closed down for that whole it time? It closed down, they gotta decontaminate everything, they okay. gotta figure out who's gonna stick around. You know, a lot of businesses didn't necessarily, weren't sure if they were gonna come back. What was this here? That was Choice and a smoke shop and a Taco Bell. Gas station. Just, just, yeah, strip malls, little retail places. They're piling it up to recycle. They're crunching up the, some of the concrete to reuse and stuff. So they're moving, but this is, this is eight months later. This is still where we're at. This is probably at, at least the remainder of the year's worth of work. It's all gone. Like, there's very little wow, spared, I mean, this, you know? This is a lot of territory. Yeah. So this, I came in here a couple days ago and I almost drove by it. I used to drive down this like three times a day, whether we're going to our, the surf school or the coffee shop. And, you know, I almost missed the turn because I haven't done it. And this house here. stayed. How is that? That's, you know. That is crazy. It, some of these houses, it's just, they just got lucky. The wind shifted before it really pushed it on. You know, other ones, maybe the construction's more robust. It's hard to say why some made it and some didn't. So this is downtown Lahaina. Yeah, this stop say? sign is Front Street. So this, oh shit, they just did this. This is our surf school right here. I mean, there's not much to see anymore. Right behind the cat? Yeah, that's where the surf school was. And then the coffee shop was right next door. The surf school we had for like four or five years. And then the coffee shop we just opened. <gasps> this year so I mean we're just eating that loss right now you know so that yeah that's hard I mean we put a lot of money into that to get it up and going and it was you know just we're just building it so it was like you know building the business so it, it's not you know we definitely lost a lot on that Jeez. so they have the drains all yeah, that's part of the, it off. That's part of the EPA. They put up these socks yeah. and try and keep whatever from getting into the ocean. So this a year ago, streets were busy, people walking around, tourists. Oh yeah. So you know this everybody asks about the banyan tree because that's like Yeah, a I was reading thing. about that. This is the oldest banyan in Hawaii, correct? Um, I don't know if it's the oldest, but it's the biggest. Okay. Basically they planted it a long time ago. They recognized that it was pretty prolific that it, you know, it was spreading out. And so they kind of made a point to aid it, you know, to grow these pillars and, yep. and expand it. And then at some point they said, this tree's doing really well, let's make it a park. Mm -hmm. And so you can see where they've cut the dead parts off. It's still surviving though, right? Yeah. Like it's still yeah. going, you see all yeah. the green on the... Yeah, so it, it should be good. This is a harbor, this is where we had, my father-in-law built a boat by hand and he had it in this harbor for 40 years. Um, that's the last thing you expect to lose in a fire is, is a boat in the harbor. Almost all the boats in here, or a lot of them are diesel. You know, once they catch on fire, the diesel spills onto the water. I've heard there was a big explosion down there that sp you know, spread a bunch of stuff, but I don't, I don't know. It wouldn't make sense that the, the gas station there blew up, so I don't, I don't really know what happened, but almost all the boats were burned. That one, honestly, you know, um, my wife's, the house they grew up in burned down, her sister's house burned down, but losing that boat, they lived in the harbor in that boat, family of five for a couple years before they built their house. And I think that was, that's like the biggest loss to them is, is losing that. You know, the other side of all this money going overseas, foreign aid, you know, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars being spent. And then we're here in a town that's still burned down eight months later. Like that's super frustrating, but FEMA has shown up. Like they weren't here the day after the fire, but they showed up and they've done a lot of things that we couldn't do as a local community, but they've spent billions of dollars here. Not necessarily just FEMA, but billions of dollars has been spent, whether it's in charitable giving, FEMA, Army Corps, wages for Red Cross, all, you know, 
just countless resources have been put here. Yeah. And we're still here eight months later. Like that's, that, uh, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not smart enough to know what to take from that, but it infuriates me, you know, like that billions of dollars has been spent and nothing has been rebuilt. It's just such a, such a, thank you. It's such a crazy thought that we're still here. And, and, you know, anytime you get something as big as the federal government involved, it, it slows things down. Coincidentally, uh, the town that I graduated high school from, Medical Lake, Washington, 10 days after our fire in August, they had a catastrophic forest fire. It's a small town, like 4,000 people, 200, uh -huh. I think 250 houses burned down. So a big, big portion of that town burned down. You know, obviously it's not the same. I think one person died, you know, it's way less buildings. But as far as timelines and similar events, you're probably not gonna get much closer and you know that town is is halfway rebuilt like that town is there's people getting close to moving into their property so you know obviously it's a different disaster different situation they're in the mainland they have different resources but it's hard to say that fema hasn't slowed things down here too you know like it's and, and i'm not saying that fema shouldn't be here and that they're they screwed up everything but it's a compromise if you're going to get all the resources from the federal government, you, you, you're gonna get some of the bureaucracy, some of the interagency, you know, they don't get along, or they, not that they don't get along, but they, they, they don't mesh as well. So when I say you, you, they're, they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars overseas, it's like, well, I don't know what they're gonna, if they spent twice as much money here, what, are, what else are they gonna do different? I don't know. It is gonna be frustrating for a long time, and then part of it is we're not really in control of it, you know? Everybody wants a timeline and, and nobody wants to give one because I don't think they really know yeah. what needs to happen, what's going to play out, where the sticking points are going to be. I, I don't think, I don't think they, they, we've gotten that far. Yeah. And, and that's the frustrating part. I mean, from the outside, and I can't speak with any credibility, I've been here a couple hours, just first impressions. It seems like as a country we'd be able to do it quicker if it was a priority, right? All hands on deck. You know, if we can go into Iraq quite quickly, right? Yeah. We should be able to be able to come into here with all the resources. You know, bring a barge in off the, off the coast, right? Yeah. With contractors and all the materials, whatever it takes, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how that would go, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, part of it is you know, a lot of people everywhere don't trust the government to do what's best for them. Yeah, know? I think more so these days, too. Yeah, so you'd have to give over a lot of control, and then you'd have to be okay with how they decide to do it. So, you know, that's that's hard, too. And, and that's, I mean, everything is damned if you do, damned if you don't, as far as from the government, from FEMA's point of view, you know, if, if they try and push through this really fast and get us back into our properties as fast as possible, then they're gonna, you know, they're gonna make somebody mad. They're gonna make somebody mad where they put the ashes. They make somebody mad that they, right. you know, they didn't do some of the, the cultural uh, research and stuff. You know, it's there's no winning this situation. We'll, we'll turn around. We'll just show you where Kanapali Beach is, just so okay. you kind of have an idea of how close. This is where kind of West Maui started with the the big hotels and the oceanfront hotels. Kanapali Beach, super famous you know, beautiful sandy beach. Black Rock is there, you know, a lot of restaurants and stuff. It's, it's just, it's a tourist spot. This is, from what I've heard, again, I don't really have the time to research and get all these, but it, the, the general understanding is this is the second biggest tourist destination in Hawaii behind Waikiki. Do the locals want people coming right now? Um, most, that's a really hard question, right? Okay, like, yeah. Like everybody, their life would be easier if they didn't have to deal with traffic, didn't have to deal with people gawking and asking questions. But right. also, there li a lot of people's lives would be a lot harder if they went out of business. So that's that reliance upon tourism that is such a tricky thing here. But yeah, nobody wants to have to explain to a stranger what just happened and why their life is upside down, you know? Nobody wants to be... Okay in a hotel room because their house burned down and that's where they have to live and listen to people drinking Mai Tais at night. Like that's... Oh, 
so is that happening? Some of the some of the victims from the fire are actually living out in some yeah, of these I mean, rooms? This this was the initial temporary housing. Okay. Um, Polly, well, this is where a lot of people were living. And, you know, so, again, I don't think these hotels would have just donated their rooms to fire victims without FEMA paying for it, you know, FEMA and Red Cross and whatnot. So, you know, it's hard to say that FEMA's screwing things up or not doing it right, but... You know, in the same time, they pay for stuff like this, and then they pay for other rentals, which raises the rental price, and everything is like this double-edged sword. This is the park. This is like a walkway between Kanapali, and there's people living there. That's the result of people being displaced. So they're not getting housing? I couldn't speak for all of them, and okay. you know, some of them may be declining it for some reason. Some of them may have slipped through the cracks, you know, but these are people that my wife, you know, knew growing up. She knew, um, you know, some of them in there and they were not homeless before the fire. So I can't say why and what, what's happening exactly, but that's a reality for some people. That's, that's their best option right now. Everybody evaluates their life and see, see where they're at and you do what makes sense. Not everybody knows the perfect path, the what, how things are gonna happen or nobody really knows and you just try and make educated guesses and, and do what you can. Some people that are, are living in these tents, maybe they don't have family or friends over here, maybe they didn't have an ID and that's why they're in there and they couldn't get help. Okay. Uh, you know, but like they're just doing what they can. For us, if we had to sell our home, it's not because, or our property here, it's not because we want to, it's because that's what makes sense. It's, that's our best option. We, we don't have anything else. We don't have a, you know another uh, fund Mm -hmm. money to pull out of to, to just pay for a home so as a firefighter you know with six years in I make about two thousand dollars a paycheck four thousand dollars a month my mortgage is thirty five hundred bucks a month and you know we have other investments that we had in place that have mortgages we will have to find another source of income and soon in order to stay here why are firefighters paid so little here because I know California firefighters are usually paid pretty well, at least my friends that were firefighters. Uh, like they're getting paid like two to three hundred thou yeah, with overtime. I, I, yeah, and with overtime, you know, if, if I worked all the overtime I could, I could probably break a hundred thousand on my income. But then, you know, 12% of that goes to our pension. The government workers out here aren't paid a lot because they don't want to have high taxes. But um, Hawaii's taxes are pretty harsh. It's one of the highest tax states, I think, what's overall. That? Hawaii. Oh, the sales tax? St the whole package, like state income. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I don't sales, know. Sales, property. I'm not, you know, I'm, I've never, I've only lived in a few other states, so I don't know income tax. But I think, I believe the fire department like the county government gets uh -huh. its, its money from property taxes. And our property taxes are a fraction of what they were in Portland. You lived in Portland, Oregon f yeah. before this, but yeah. your wife's from here originally. Yes. You know, that was kind of the plan when we moved over here is we, we had the jobs with the fire department. Then we said, we got to get, got to figure out a secondary income. And my wife had always wanted to do a surf school. And so that's where, you know, we the opportunity came up soon after we got out of Mm -hmm. uh, recruit class and we just kind of took it on you know we came over here we did okay with housing investments in, in Oregon and that was kind of our nest egg to make it like safe to move over here and, and like the, the point of me saying this is that it's hard for us you know like there's people with a lot less than us that are that are trying to keep their home and, and I don't know how we're gonna do it and there's you know, you'll see signs and there's always emphasis, you know, keep Lahaina lands in Lahaina hands. But it's like, okay, in about six months, people are going to run out of insurance money. Like, we need something different. We need something that says, okay, you know, let, let's pause the mortgages. Let's do something. You know, we can't just keep deferring it and we can't expect people work a job, build their home, pay, pay rent, and pay their mortgage. Like... It's naive to think that anybody will stay if they have to do all of those. Like, Lahaina's great. I love Lahaina. This, this is, you know, I was ready to live the rest of my life here. But if we have to do all of those, pay rent, pay our mortgage, work two jobs and build a home, it's, it's not worth being here. We'll sell, we'll, you know, we'll do what our best option is. Oh, and that's to yeah. sell for whoever the highest, you know, whoever can pay off the most debt. 
So that's that's the reality of being, uh, you know, like we don't have a trust fund. My dad's an immigrant. Mm-hmm. My my wife's parents, you know, he was a carpenter. He built stuff. Like he, he worked his whole life. He's yeah. He just retired in his seventies. Is there any of that going on now? Like people coming in with huge money and buying up parcels, or it's unknown? There has hardly been any sales, as far as I know. I mean. Okay. Like any, there's definitely not anything listed on the the MLS. Okay. Uh, I don't. Th- I think they have to report all the sales. I don't think there's anything happening under the table that is unreported. But there's very few sales. The a few months ago there was an article about that, and there had been one sale of the ownership of a condo that burned down. So okay. people haven't come in and and um, you know there's people. I've gotten a few calls of people. You know some investor from Florida, you know, that they, they don't even have a footprint online. So I don't even, it could have been a scam as far as I know, you know, okay. like, but yeah, there's, there's definitely, you hear about people getting calls, Hey, you know, we'll buy your property for cash. But I, I don't think, I mean, right now people are able to defer their payments, but that, that stuff's stacking up and there's like the clock is ticking on how long we can do deferred mortgages, how long we can pay rents. And, and at some point there will be a period where the best option is to sell your home and go somewhere else, or to sell your property and go somewhere else. These are all new power lines? Yeah, they replaced all this stuff. That's, you know, they have some existing ones standing next to them. For a long time, if the wind blew over 50 miles an hour, you would lose power in West Maui. Power lines would break. You know, that's been a known thing for a long time. So obviously some of those power lines break and there's dry grass underneath them. They, that that starts fires, you know. That's not me saying anything official. Like that's just anybody that can see, can see that that's, that would happen. Is that somewhat of the consensus, would you say? Or I mean, there's, there's literally a video that was on the internet from day one of a down power line starting the fire up there. But I mean, that's part of the problem is like, they're all back up. Like these power lines were blocking this this lane of the highway. They were blocking this road so we couldn't get out this way. We had to drive back through the fire or, you know, into the fire. So as a resident here, it's concerning that here's dry grass, here's power lines. We're just waiting for the wind again, you know? It's gonna be expensive to put them underground. It's gonna cause outages. It's gonna be a pain in the ass to put them underground. But I think anybody would rather have that than a fire. Part of why this fire was so catastrophic, it had a number of factors. A lot of houses, they're built up where they have an additional rental on it and maybe it's not permitted. You know, that's, that's not uncommon out here. People have to, in order to pay their bills, their mortgage, they, you, you have another rental. And, and the rental market is so hard that people are willing to live in, you know, not legal construction. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the problem and there's no, you know, there's no easy fix to it. You know, you can't just go out, go out and start evicting everybody and, and slap in on citations for illegal construction. You're gonna, that's not a winning move, you know? So that's, that's a hard conversation that, that people, you know, in the local government and people need to have. It's like the building code and all that is there for a reason. And once we start ignoring it, then it creates the potential for these problems. I'm one person out here I don't have time to even affect local politics. You know, you, you got two jobs and kids, and then we got to rebuild a house. And it's not like, even if I what, did have time to research and sign petitions and all that, like, what does it actually do? You know? In loving memory, all the people that passed in the fire. Yeah. This memorial in honor of our family and friends that we lost in the August 8th, 2023 wildfire.
I think a lot of people will see this video and they'll be like, what can I do to help? What, what can people from the mainland or the world or whomever, is there anything they can actually do or is it? Uh, like sadly, the, and I, I know it's not like the most rewarding thing to just give money, but like what most people still need is just money to make it through this. Yep. But um, kind of more long-term, when this place gets cleared up, crews of skilled construction workers. Yep. You know, whether it's through churches or whatever organizations, there's gonna have to be a lot of organizing of that. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be on their own building their house, you know? Okay. And it, we don't have the housing to house a ton of, you know, a ton of people. So it right. kind of needs to be focused, targeted groups of people that, that can do the construction. Gotcha. Is there a website? Is there anything anyone can go to? to become part of this. We're not there no, yet. We're no, not. that's, yeah, we're not there. Yeah, okay. uh, you know, there there will be organizations and, and sadly, I can't say which ones are the ones that are gonna be making, getting it done, okay. you know. It's, if it's if there is a good one out there that we yeah. don't know about, please, please leave the link below. And not one of those 2% goes to the cause organizations. Yeah. Not, yeah. not 98 to, to administration yeah, fees. and costs. Yeah. Right, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is is don't, you know, we need help to make this town anything of what it was mm -hmm. and, and to keep the people here that belong here and that, that made this town, you know, we're, we're going to need help, so. Okay. Johnny, yeah. thanks for bringing yeah. us in. Uh, you yeah. didn't have to do that, um, yeah. but you give us a very calm, I felt very honest look at the situation yeah. and uh, thanks yeah, for sharing your story. That's what I try to do. So. All right. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for coming along on that journey. Until the next one.